Hi everyone, I'm Scott from the Old Curiosity Shop. A couple of videos ago, I created quite a stir when I filmed from this angle, and several people said, why does he have a casket in his living room? <laughs> well, when I went back and looked, it kind of does look like a casket from this angle, but it's not. It's actually a phonograph, and that's what I'm gonna talk about in this video. Now, yes, I called it a phonograph, but can I call it a Victrola? I mean, most people do. Well, actually, no, technically you can't. It's not a Victrola. How come? Well, stay tuned and I'm gonna tell you why. There's an old curiosity shop. Every once in a while I go by there. Oh, the fond recollections that lie there. Okay, here's a little disclaimer. There's going to be no thrift haul in this video, and we're really going to geek out on history. So, what's the big deal? Victrola, phonograph, gramophone, talking machine, what difference does it make? Well, in the scope of human existence, probably nothing. Yes, you can call it a Victrola, you can call it a talking machine, you can call it a phonograph, but actually, we, as I said, are going to get very technical and dive into the history as to why, technically, it's not a Victrola. Okay, let's start with Thomas Edison, who invents the ability to record human voice in 1877. Now, a little caveat, Edison did not work by himself. He wasn't a lone inventor in the basement of some New Jersey warehouse. He had, uh, at Menlo Park in Edison, uh, in New Jersey, a, uh, really an invention factory with about a hundred guys working for him. Many very talented men. So, uh, he kind of gets all the credit, but there are a lot of unsung heroes. I just had to throw that in there. And by the way, the man who made the first model phonograph happened to be a German-American. Okay, so I had to give that little shout out to, to my people. Anyway, Edison does invent the tin foil uh, talking machine in 1877. Now he is the one who calls it a phonograph. Also generically, a talking machine. Um, and his original machine is not flat round discs like we're used to but he recorded on cylinders. I have several of them, uh, but they're tucked away somewhere. And deep in my archive, there's a video of me playing an old Edison Ambarola cylinder player. So if you're interested in that, you can look for it and, and um, watch it. I'll probably put the link to that below. So back to Edison in 1877. Um, he invents this machine to record the human voice on cylinders, which looks like toilet paper rolls, and they're covered in tin foil. Now his machine is clumsy, it's unreliable, um, and he really just sort of views it as a novelty, uh, really as a toy. Um, Edison was a brilliant man, but he didn't quite see the potential for his invention. So although it was exhibited here in Philadelphia, and I'm looking in that direction towards Fairmount Park, less than a mile from here, and then Edison moved on. He just said, okay, I'm done. And he started to work on other things, electrical power and um, the light bulb. So for about 10 years, he doesn't mess with the uh, phonograph at all. Well, some other folks came along. Uh, Mr. Bell, yes, the same Alexander Graham Bell, who was the teacher of the deaf who invented the telephone. He begins experimenting and making some improvements on Edison's phonograph. He gets a patent. Now the word gramophone never really caught on here in the United States, but it did catch on in Europe. So that's the reason why our friends in England refer to them as gramophone records, and we in the US refer to them as phonograph records, although we don't really talk about records anymore. Records being the flat disc, uh, you're gonna see one in a minute. So Bell gets some, uh, some of his own patents, 
And another uh, German-born American inventor, I think he came to America in, the, in his 20s, a man named Emil Berliner. He begins tinkering, and he comes up with a way to record on the actual flat disc, um, the vertical, um, uh, the lateral disc, lateral recording on a disc instead of Edison's Hill and Dale uh, recordings on tinfoil. I'm getting a little too technical, but we're coming back to this in a minute. So all of a sudden, Edison goes, aha, I've got these people fiddling around with my invention. Edison had quite an ego. And so Emil Berliner has his disc, and he starts making uh, machines to play his flat discs upon. Uh, Alexander Graham Bell is got his patents for the gramophone. And then Edison starts fiddling around to make improvements as well. Now, let's go back to Emil Berliner for a minute. Berliner's machine was awkward. Uh, the machine on which he played the discs um, did not have a, a permanent spring that you could wind with a motor, let go of the spring, and let the thing play. In order to play his machines, you had to crank it the entire time. Well, you can imagine if you were cranking too fast, the record would speed up and sound like Mickey Mouse. If you started to crank too slow, it would do that. So you have to stand there the whole time. That wasn't going to work. So Emil Berliner uh, decides to go to a Camden, New Jersey machine shop right across the river in that direction, Camden, New Jersey. And he goes to this machine shop who's owned and operated by a man named um, Eldridge R. Johnson. Eldridge Reeves Johnson, who was born in Wilmington, Delaware. And he has nothing to do with f phonographs or anything. But Berliner goes and says, hey, here's a machine. Can you create a motor that, you know, we can crank it up and then the thing will play on its own? And um, Johnson begins tinkering with this. And uh, he comes up with uh, the crank motor. At first, the crank was on the top, and you cranked it this way. But you could let it go, and the thing would play all the way through, much more marketable. So Berliner and Johnson team up, and uh, there's all types of litigation that's beginning to happen between uh, Johnson and Berliner, and then later Edison gets involved, and Bell gets involved, and it's a hot mess. Everybody's in and out of court, uh, uh, suing each other for patent infringements and such. And what happens, uh, one day in uh, 1901, Mr. Johnson wins in court. He gets the right to uh, make his own machines with the motor that he invented. And he founds, in Camden, New Jersey, the Victor Talking Machine Company. Now, we're getting close to Victrola, right? Are you still with me? Half of you have tuned me out off already. So Johnson now, in 1901, has his Victor Talking Machine Company. By the way, how did he come up with the name? Well, remember I said he was a bicycle, in his machine shop, he also repaired bicycles. Collectors of old bicycles know there was a bicycle called Victor. He liked the name and he just borrowed it and called himself the Victor Talking Machine Company. Notice he can't use the word uh, gramophone or phonograph. His machines are just called talking machines, the Victor talking machine. And we've all seen the painting done by the French artist of Nipper the dog listening to his master's voice through the great big horn. Yes? Well, that is, um, Johnson bought the painting. There's more history to that, but that's too deep. And this becomes the famous trademark of the Victor Talking Machine Company. Well, that machine with that outside horn that was popular for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, but it wasn't a very refined uh, machine. It wasn't a beautiful piece of mahogany furniture. It didn't blend well into the front parlor. It was rather an awkward thing. 
And you can imagine we're sort of uh, in the Edwardian era, 1905, 6, 1902, and a lot of um, housekeepers didn't really care for this great big tin horn uh, sticking out in the middle of their parlors. So Johnson goes to a Philadelphia furniture company called the Pooley, P-O-O-L-E-Y, I believe, uh, furniture company, and says, can you design me some type of a cabinet where I can install my talking machines, and instead of this great big horn sticking out, the horn can actually be on the inside, and it'll look like a beautiful piece of furniture. Well, they come up with the first floor model console standing talking machine with an inside horn. You see, the horn is still there. It's just doubled under and encased inside of the actual cabinet. It was awkward looking, but some revisions were made and the standard machine Victrola was born. Now, Edison, or rather, Johnson had to have a new name for his inside horn machines, and he called them the Victrola. Victor, V-I-C-T-O-R, and then the suffix O-L-A, Victrola. The suffix O-O-L-A was very popular. Um, he probably was inspired by the word pianola, which was a type of player piano attachment thing. But there were lots of olas, Crayola, Motorola, pianola. Uh, later on, Edison would come up with Amberola, and you can probably think of several others. So that's where the name Victrola comes from. So it's a name that was a trademark owned by the Victor Talking Machine Company, and Victrola is what was referred to as their inside horn machines. So now you know. Edison didn't call his machines Victrolas. They were phonographs. And as I said, uh, to confuse you even more, when Victor uh, gave their rights, uh, allowed the Columbia Company to have the patent rights, they created a machine and they couldn't call it a uh, gramophone, they called it a graphophone. So when you see a, a, a machine made by Columbia, it will have the word graphophone on it. So it's like the old Venn diagram, Venn diagram that we learned, remember in the fifth grade with the overlapping circles? Uh, let's see. Gramophones, Victrolas, and graphophones are all talking machines. But not all talking machines are Victrolas, right? You, it's kind of like Kleenex and tissue. It's a brand name. So today, when anybody sees a old-fashioned record player like this, they, they usually just generically say, oh, it's a Victrola, and that's fine. However, if you're going to sell an item, um, it helps to be as specific and as accurate as you can by making sure that you call a Victrola a Victrola and all those other names after that. Now, I skipped a whole lot, and this was not meant to be a comprehensive history of any of those companies or inventors. But this machine behind me, which some of you thought was a casket when I filmed from that side, um, is a talking machine. And the brand name is Silvertone. And this was made in 1918. And you remember Silvertone was the brand name of phonographs that were sold by the Sears and Roebuck Company. And that's what you see right here. Um, it looks like a Victrola, but there are lots of um, differences on this that are probably way too technical to get into. Uh, so, <coughs> excuse me, I hope you enjoyed that little discussion. Um, it is a fascinating history. I've been fiddling with phonographs for since I was a teenager. I actually was given one uh, as a high school graduation gift by a relative. Um, I'll tell you about that some other time. But let's open this up and cut the rug, shall we? Okay.
let's do that. So we'll open up the lid here, and you can see what's different from um, the Victrola. There would be two doors on the front that you open and close, and those doors are the volume control. We don't have those doors here because that was a patent that Victor had. But what we do have, and I'll show you, if I pull this beautiful fretwork off, there we go. Give you a close-up of that. We can see on the inside here, we see uh, a lot of dust. <laughs> but we see nothing but a wooden horn. So the great big horn that used to be up here is now wooden, and it's on the inside. There is a little gizmo back here that you can't see that I can open and close to adjust the volume on this machine. But it's all done mechanically um, and acoustically. There's no electricity here. Uh, so you can't really see what I, well maybe you can. We'll give her a crank and uh, let's listen to just a little bit of the static strut by Louis Armstrong and his orchestra. We won't listen to too much of it because I'll get one of those little copyright strikes. Okay, folks, roll back the carpet. Here we go. Beat lum bum, it's hot like that. Beat lum bum, beat lum bum, it's hot. 